They say a hero is only as good as their villain, which, as far as we're concerned, makes a good big bad more important than the protagonist. So, let's spend 10 picks trying to piece together the best one ever. Here are our picks for the top 10 movie villains of all time. Like any big screen black hat worth their salt, a good villain has to have a lot going on. One dimensional mustache twirlers can be fun, but the villains that truly stand out employ a combination of less than virtuous characteristics. So we'll be spending our 10 spots looking at the different ways a baddie can do their worst, hoping the shape of I think the ultimate villain will emerge. Like a hulking and unstoppable killing machine through the fog, sneaking up on us like a floating POV shot from behind those trees right over there. <laughs> Speaking of which, the first thing a villain ought to be is just plain scary. This is fear on the most basic level, and inflicting the spine tingles and the hair raises on the innocent is entry-level villainy. Motives and nuance and backstory aren't even part of the equation yet. This is Pazuzu from The Exorcist, possessing a young girl to terrifying ends. This is the Devil Reborn as Damien in The Omen. This is any number of demons that are just evil for the sake of it, but this is also every slasher ever. Freddy Krueger straddles the line of Supernatural and Slasher, it's Jason Voorhees in a hockey mask, and it's our number 10 pick in a William Shatner mask, Michael Myers. Hey, look. Look where? Behind the bush. I don't see anything. The guy who drove by so fast, that one you yelled at? Oh, subtle, isn't he? Creep. Michael Myers in Halloween was on the cutting edge of the burgeoning genre of slasher films. A case study in projecting fear, he's terrifying, and he does it slowly and silently. He's a knife-wielding blank face, literally a mask on which we can project our own fears, which is the true brilliance of the mask. Whatever you had a nightmare about last night, guess what? That's what Michael Myers is. Mysteriously unstoppable no matter how many windows you throw him out of, Myers is the boogeyman that lives in real life, and the universal blank page fear he was designed to instill is an excellent trait to give any villain. I touched on it a bit with Michael Myers, but let's add a full layer of unstoppableness to our villain. On top of being just regular old scary, a good villain needs to feel almost unbeatable, indestructible, inevitable? A villain that you're scared of and can't see a way to defeat, that's strong stuff for a hero to overcome. Think about Max Cady in either version of Cape Fear in his relentless pursuit. The cold and stoic Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men. The Terminators fit this bill in a very hard to kill sense, but we can't forget about an unrelenting intellect as well, a villain with a seemingly perfect plan. The Incredibles gave us two pretty good ones in Syndrome and Screen Slaver, while Die Hard gave us the brothers Gruber in Hans and Simon, who were both just a New York cop away from sitting on a beach earning 20%. But when it comes to both scary and how the hell do we defeat this thing, it's really hard to pick against the disembodied, unblinking eye of Sauron. One does not simply walk into Mordor, nor does one simply explain how good a villain Sauron really is. Sauron is a villain from ages past, a legend thought long dead, but still stirring his armies to his evil ends from the top of a tower in the deadliest land in all of Middle-earth. He's got legions of orc, Saruman the Wise commanding the fighting Uruk-hai, he's got a witch king as a henchman flying around on a fell beast, Sauron's forces are formidable to say the very least. But he begins to defeat you as soon as you decide to move against him, not actually forcing his strength in combat. The insidiousness of his evil that it warps and corrupts and addicts those who bear it as a burden makes the Dark Lord's particular flavor of Unstoppable such a good addition to this villain we're building. Before we go too much further, we can't forget one of the more basic pillars of villainy. You probably ought to hate them. 
A good villain should engender a fair bit of active dislike. To stand in opposition to the hero of the film, the character whom, in simplest terms, we want to win. That means our villain needs to be repellent enough that we want them to lose. This is the cruel and inhumane streak you see in Baron Harkonnen from Doom. Captain Vidal in Pan's Labyrinth. Think about Commodus in Gladiator, cheating and scheming and literally backstabbing his way through ruling Rome. There's an incredible spaghetti western called The Great Silence and Klaus Kinski's Loco is just the worst slash best kind of sniveling little shit. If it's Mr. Potter ruining an entire town, Mrs. Danvers destroying a newlywed sanity, or the rich guy from Pig ruining one man's life, there's a catharsis to hating a villain. And perhaps no villain is more worthy of disdain than Nurse Ratchet. No, 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 no. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is a film about some of society's most vulnerable people, and for Nurse Ratched to lord her power over the patients whose well being is, in theory, her responsibility, makes her all the more despicable. Her villainy, though, transcends her character and gives us an example of an antagonist who is every bit as metaphorically as she is literally imposing. Nurse Ratched is a stand-in for institutional control, the result of bureaucracy's laziest worst-case scenario, where horrible people can wield a broken system's power without repercussions. Hers is an opportunistic villainy, as she's found a place where her proclivities aren't only tolerated, but rewarded. She's the right villain in the right time and place to thrive as a big bad, and it's exactly the kind of thing I love to hate on screen. Adding to our villainous gumbo, we must next turn to more personality-based traits. Scary, unstoppable, and I hate that person are just the base of the soup, the mere poids and stock that are necessary, but in need of accentuation to truly become a not boring soup. The first stop here, I believe, is unpredictability. Gun. I want my villain to be chaotic, with no way to know what they're about to do, and thus, no way to know how to combat them either. Think of Mad Dog from The Raid, or Tommy from Goodfellas. This is Luther from The Warriors, and Ishii the Killer, the intruders in Funny Games, and I think maybe the entire cast of Nocturnal Animals, that bunch of assholes. Alex in A Clockwork Orange, Candy and Django Unchained, Alonzo Harris in Training Day. Turns out, cinema is chock full of loose cannon bad guys, but for my money, the most who knows what he's about to do villain I've ever seen is Lil Z from City of God. In the Brazilian favela known as City of God, Lil Z is a sociopath who grows up killing because it kinda makes him giggle. <laughs> The calculated violence he perpetrates as an almost adult taking over the drug dealing operation in town has a certain unfeeling logic to it. If the kids in the slums are causing too many problems, shoot one. If you want your neighbor's turf, just kill him and take it. There's no grand long-term plan for Lil Z. It's what makes sense in the moment and there's no telling how he'll react. The truly fascinating part of Lil Z as a villain though is what drives that chaos. He watches his friends no, his colleagues. No, that's not right either. The people around him that he hasn't killed yet. He sees the normalcy they've got in their lives and clearly wants it on some level. But he just as clearly can't make it happen. The chaos lurking right under the surface is too much of a force. He's an antagonist with thin skin, real emotional instability, and a willingness to murder at the drop of the hat. He's a volatile combination of everything we've talked about so far and a much needed component for our cobbled together supervillain. Quick tangent, watching City of God with present day commercials mixed in on Amazon Prime is wild. So far, we've got a scary and unpredictable villain who seems unstoppable, which we hate. And it stands to reason that if we hate these villains, we want them to lose. That also means we want them to fail in achieving their goal, which additionally means they have to actually have a goal. They have to want something. And the best type of villainous goals come with a singular focus on achieving it. Gordon Gekko's greed is good mantra is a Machiavellian credo for trampling people on the way to the top. It's old boy's Wu Jin and his years long crusade to exact revenge. Matt in Sicario breaking any rule he feels like in service of his goal. It's even HAL 9000's artificially intelligent drive to astronauticide. But 
There's an obsession wing of this particular Hall of Fame, Annie Wilkes breaking her favorite author's legs in misery, Immortan Joe marshalling a post-apocalyptic army to get his harem back, Barbara Stanwyck as Double Indemnity's scheming housewife, and our number seven, Alex Forrest from Fatal Attraction. We are gonna live with this for the rest of our lives. I know that. I've thought of that. I know how you feel, it's a big thing. But it doesn't have to be a problem, really, it doesn't. You play fair with me, I'll play fair with you. First point here is that she's for sure not the only villain of this movie. As rabbit boilingly vengeful as she becomes, Michael Douglas's Dan is the one screwing around on his wife. Hers is a villainy that is brought on entirely by the would-be protagonist's choices. Alex Forrest is the bad things that happen to people who do bad things themselves. There are no excuses that will defend Dan's infidelity, nor should there be any sympathy sent his way for the hole he dug for himself and his family. The lack of responsibility he takes until he's absolutely forced to earns him exactly zero pity. Alex Forrest, in that sense, is almost a force of karmic justice. She's a whirlwind of anger, bitterness, and revenge. The singular focus shown in extracting what she believes she's owed is truly remarkable, if not unbelievable, problematic even. Alex Forrest and the noirish erotic thriller she brought to the top of the box office created a string of imitators in the genre. Some worked, some didn't, but none had quite the same deranged commitment to tearing somebody's life apart. Even if there's a version of this story where she's not the antagonist, that type of dedication to a goal is something I want in the perfect on-screen villain. So here's the other thing, we all want something. We all know what it's like to have a goal and to chase it down in sometimes unhealthy ways. So even if they're scary, chaotic, unbeatable, utterly loathsome and singularly focused, if they had a goal at all, that means they're more than a little relatable too. There are charming rogues who are undeniably on the wrong side of things, like Loki or Bodhi from Point Break. There's a version of Harry Lime who's just a charming guy trying to make a post-war buck, but oh, also, a bunch of kids died because of his scheme. But even the most sinister folks can charm. We're looking to dial up the I get you to off the charts levels of empathy. Lotso Huggin' Bear has an incredibly tragic story you can't help but feel for. This is Carrie's abuse at prom. It's Frankenstein's monster in a meta way because he shouldn't be thought of as the villain at all. But for my money, it's got to be Francis Ford Coppola's version of Count Dracula. We, Dracula's have a right to be proud. What devil or rich was ever so great as a dealer whose blood flows in these veins? The ages spanning love story in Bram Stoker's Dracula is timeless in several ways. There's the obvious centuries the story spans, but it's also a simple and classic tale of loss and longing. Vampires have always been seductive in the cinema, but Gary Oldman's charisma as the infamous Count, even as a weird dog man, elicits such empathy it's hard not to like him, even when he's murdering the friends of his love interest. The gruesome and stylized opening battle sequence paints the portrait of a barbarian ruler savaging his enemies on pikes, but the tragedy that truly creates Dracula isn't of his own design. His is a villainy born from external forces. The vengeful Turks shot an arrow into the castle, carrying false news of Dracula's death. Elisabetta, believing him dead, flung herself into the river. Who hasn't had the great love of their life taken from them like that? Dracula was let down by the church he swore to protect, then cursed by the same power. His rage and anger are understandable even if being an immortal bloodthirsty vampire is not. That is what I want in my villain. No matter how outlandish or larger than life a villain may appear, if their motives stay grounded and relatable, they become that much more formidable, and that is a valuable trait to include in our villain. Okay, so wait a minute. How much do we need to feel for our villain? With Count Dracula's long-lost love heaping tragedy onto the vampire and Alex Forrest maybe not being a villain at all, we've taken a turn into some not villainous territory. Whatever's happening, it's clear I'm wanting to empathize with my big bad. So if we find ourselves understanding a villain to the point that we may even be rooting for them, are they actually the hero? Think about Koba from Planet of the Apes, who might have been right the whole time. This is Ed Harris in The Rock, a good guy doing bad things, but for good guy reasons. Amy from Gone Girl wasn't wrong about Nick, but takes things 
well, pretty far from there. There's a way to watch The Graduate, where Ben is very much the antagonist of the story, but that's more a supposed hero who's actually a villain, which is the opposite of what I'm talking about here. But there's really only one quote-unquote villain that jumps to mind for this. The replicant fighting for his own mortality, Roy Batty from Blade Runner. What seems to be the problem? Death. Death. Well, I'm afraid that's a little out of my jurisdiction. You... I want more life, father. We'd felt real feelings for robots before. By 1982, everything from Star Wars on back through the day the Earth stood still to Metropolis, a machine cast in man's image is shorthand for discussing a god complex. Where Roy Batty and Blade Runner was a tipping point for AI on screen is in Roy's desperation to not die. Roy was a purpose-made being who found a purpose of his own. He didn't ask to be made any more than a person can. He's simply asking to not be unmade, to have his experience validated and not dismissed. Particularly when set against the film's protagonist, a Blade Runner who's frankly not very good at his job, there's an edit of the film that's not very far from the original, or from any one of the recuts, where Roy is a freedom fighter given his proper due. Like so many Frankenstein's monsters before him, Roy Batty isn't fighting against anybody so much as he is for himself, which creates a layered villain that's hard to argue with. We've only got three spots left, and we've built a terrifyingly unstoppable, hateable tornado of chaos with a semi-relatable intense focus on a goal that makes you think, are they actually the hero? That potent mix got us all the way to Roy Batty, who, particularly juxtaposed with the hero he's antagonizing, it's super clear there's at least one obvious trait every good villain needs. They have to be a good foil for the hero. Saving the day should not only mean winning a conflict, but overcoming something internal as well. A hero needs an opposite number, the other side to their coin, and a proper villain should provide that. This is Professor Moriarty, matching intellects and, in more recent iterations, slow motion imaginary fighting skill with Sherlock Holmes, but using his powers for destructive ends instead of the greater good. This is Magneto, wanting to eradicate the people who hate him, while Professor X longs for peace between the two groups. Killmonger wants to use Wakanda's resources to attack, while T'Challa wants to defend. Lumberg from Office Space, Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life, Biff Tannen, or all the Tannins for that matter, each of them represents something diametrically opposed to the film's would-be hero. But none of them are the yin to their hero's yang, quite like the Joker. Go back to ripping off mob dealers? No, 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 you, you complete me. You're garbage, you kills for money. Don't talk like one of them, you're not. Even if you'd like to be. There's never been a better live action dynamic between a Batman and a Joker than Heath Ledger's turn as the Clown Prince of Crime. Mark Hamill's animated dynamic with the late great Kevin Conroy was great, and the Lego Batman's relationship with Joker was surprisingly heartfelt, but the way Heath Ledger's Joker perfectly opposes Christian Bale's Batman is unmatched. The mysterious clown terrorizing Gotham is the chaos to juxtapose Batman's need for order. There's a joy to the way Joker antagonizes the Dark Knight because he is fully aware that he would not exist without Batman. Indeed, part of Batman's journey in The Dark Knight is reckoning with the fact that he escalated villainy in Gotham. The Joker's reign in the underworld is a direct result of the cape and cowl first appearing, which provides a truly unique challenge for a film's hero to overcome. There's one thing we haven't talked about yet, which is the origin of the villain. And I don't mean tragic backstories that would fall into one of the previous categories. What I mean here is, how does a villain come at the hero? From what shadows do they crawl? What if we can't see them coming at all? These are the wolves in sheep's clothing. And maybe this speaks to the basic fear that we started with way back at number 10, but the villain might be standing next to you right now. The call could be coming from inside the house. This is regular and helpful guy Norman Bates, who turns out to be both a psycho and his own mother. A jealous kidnapper who's watched your safe space on a hill from afar in high and low. Old friends who just happened to make some new friends since the last time you saw them in The Invitation. But my pick here is more recent than that. The Armitage family in Get Out. Here, you're gonna love this. My, my dad's claim to fame 
was beat by Jesse Owens in the qualifying round for the Berlin Olympics in 1936. Those are the ones where... Well, Owens won in front of Hitler. Yeah, what a moment, what a moment. I mean, Hitler's up there with all his perfect Aryan race bullshit. This black dude comes along, proves him wrong in front of the entire world. Amazing. Tough break for your dad, though. Yeah. He almost got over it. The way this family goes about their villainy is truly insidious. Luring the unsuspecting Chris, dressed up as something welcoming and open. They not only pretend to be friendly, but they also just seem kind of dumb. What's more fascinating about this family of villains is, by the time their real intentions are laid bare, their scheming has highlighted a whole other form of systemic villainy. There's an ignorance and arrogance to the Armitage's guests at the auction that are familiar characteristics to a brand of racists more commonly portrayed in film. But here, they're tinged with an obliviousness, the liberal, oh, but I don't have a racist bone in my body. The Armitage family shows an intentionality underneath it all, however, a danger lurking in the motives of those who would claim to be allies. While the film is brilliant for many reasons that are tied for most brilliant, the deceitfulness of the Armitage family is also right at the top of that list. We've got a compelling villainous stew through nine picks and it's time to bring it home. So let's forget about what might be lurking next door and spend some time with what's lurking within. The most compelling villain represents our darkest urges. It's scary to confront those in ourselves. They show up sporadically, chaotically. Some would argue that we can never truly defeat them, only prevent them from taking the wheel and steering. And so it seems to me that the key to the perfect villain is to show the hero a dark mirror, to be a screen on which to project everything we're scared of in ourselves. Humanity's darkest desires have always shown up in villains. This is Travis Bickle, who is not an anti-hero, he's just the worst. Tyler Durden is literally a manifestation of id and impulse. Hannibal Lecter probably fits here as well, alongside Beckert from M. And the Cenobites from Hellraiser, this is their whole deal. But for our number one pick, the most fascinating combination of everything we've talked about so far is Frank Booth from Blue Velvet. Who is this f**k? A friend. He's from the neighborhood. We were just talking. Oh. You're from the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Your neighbor. Well, what's your name, neighbor? Jeffrey. He's a good kid, Frank. Shut the f up. Frank Booth is goddamn terrifying. He's a nightmare of a villain who, depending on your feelings about David Lynch's work in general, might be a literal nightmare. He's clearly insane, out of control, and checks all the boxes we've set down so far. Why are there people like Frank? Why is there so much trouble in this world? He's intimidating in a way that makes you feel physically unsafe. He's a whirlwind force of nature, a chaotic guessing game of who knows what's next. Dennis Hopper's performance is also tinged with a deep inner pain that while he's so far gone, maybe the tragedy that made him this way would make for its own equally great movie. He's the seedy underbelly opposite number to Kyle MacLachlan's upper crust bubble and the end of a journey MacLachlan's Jeffrey maybe shouldn't have taken in the first place. The end of the road when you listen to that weird urge to give in to impulses, or in this case, you know, investigate an ear you found in a field and begin an affair with a clearly distressed lounge singer. On top of everything else, Frank Booth is the answer to what happens when you look at your darkest inner desires, which is why he may just be the perfect movie villain. You're like me. That'll do it for this list in my weird little villain assembly line. Give it a shot yourself next time you're imagining an antagonist for some reason. Or just curious if that really is a human ear. Yes, that's a human ear, all right. Oh, okay, well, that answers that, I suppose. But for all the rest, be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more Cinefix movie lists.